point. So you, you would give us a little bit of sign if we would be too long. I will try to, but yes, I'll try not to. I, I'm sure you're going to do it one time. I don't know whether I was going to get any more. You want to start now? Um, I was going to give it one minute, but I think we'll start very shortly because we're going to lose too much time. No, okay. There's some more coming in. Mm. <laughs> Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll make a start so we don't eat into our 90 minutes too long or too much. Welcome to the, uh, the parallel session on Inspire Access and Agreements. My name is Claire Hadley. I come from Ordnance Survey of Great Britain, and I'm your chair for the next 90, uh, 85 minutes. Um, we've got five speakers in the programme today. I've actually taken the liberty of changing the order very slightly, and I'm going to ask Bastian von Lernen to speak first, and then I think the rest of the order is similar to the one in your programme. Um, the way we're going to play this is uh, we've got three quite distinct topics to cover today, um, data protection, licensing, and access control. Um, so we're going to arrange it in that order, and we'll pause at the end of each topic to take some specific questions on that theme, and then hopefully still leaving a nice bit of time at the end for a general discussion as to how, how these areas interact and overlap considerably. So we'll start off with Bastian. Uh, I've asked the speakers only to speak for about 10 minutes to give us a good, a good amount of uh, discussion time. So do start preparing your questions as we go along, because there'll be, I hope, plenty of time to, to answer them and talk about these things later on. OK, I'll pass over to you, Bastian. Thank you, Claire. Yes, uh, data protection and inspire an uncomfortable combination. Uh, we were uh, I'm co-authoring this uh, abstract with my uh, colleagues uh, Stefan Kulk and, uh, and Henrik Kluger, and we were also considering a different title: uh, data protection and inspire an inconvenient truth. Uh, but we are not sure what the real truth is, uh, but we know that there is an. Uh, I say a conflict uh, of interest uh, between data protection and inspire objectives, and that's the thing I want to make clear in this presentation. Since we have to uh, keep it very short, uh, start with the data protection. Uh, data protection in Europe uh, is uh, all evolving around the uh, data protection directive, and in this data protection directive, there's one uh, concept central, and that's the concept of uh, personal data. Personal data is any uh, information related to an identified or identifiable individual, a natural person. And an identifiable uh, natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identification number. And an identification number can be a parcel ID or an address or an IP address even. Uh, to determine whether a data set or uh, information is uh, personal or uh, identifiable, you should also take a look at uh, the, the, the means likely reasonably to be used uh, by the controller, so the one who has the data, the data provider, or any other person um, that is able to identify the said person. So it's not only the data provider who has to make uh, an, uh, an uh, uh, who is using the data and potentially can link the data to an individual, the data provider also has to consider whether other people can uh, use the data and link it to an individual. Um, if there is uh, personal data involved, then the directive applies. And then there are all kinds of requirements uh, you have to fulfill. One of the major uh, and most important one is that the data can only be processed for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes. And there are many others, but another one is uh, that the data can not be lo any longer processed than strictly necessary for the fulfillment of these purposes. So the specified and explicit purposes. Looking at geo, um, is geo information personal data? Just one example here. An aerial, 
image. How many of you think this is personal data? How many of you say, you say it is one? More? Let's say like five out of 50, 10%. Well, let's see. In Belgium, uh, we have uh, Flanders, they have uh, the, an, an independent data uh, protection agency, and they rule as follows. The satellite image contains uh, uh, images of parcels. These parcels are owned by natural persons and companies, but not relevant for now. Based on the parcel information, government can identify the natural person, for example, through the land registry, and therefore, in Belgium, in Flanders, this is considered to be personal data. If that applies, oh, that even go further. Uh, they say, well, we have, uh, if the, the, the data is available at a scale of one to 50,000 or less, so less detail, one to 100,000 and up, uh, then the data should not be considered to be personal data. If it's uh, more detailed, in this case it was one to 10,000, uh, then it certainly is personal data. Uh, and they also ruled that the data should then not be processed any further or any longer than strictly necessary for the accomplishment of these purposes. <coughs> that implies that uh, the address and building data, that is uh, open data in the Netherlands, um, apparently also is uh, personal data. Because there is an address, there is some information about the buildings, uh, and with a link to the cadaster, very easily uh, the natural person is identified and this should be considered personal data. And we have a real life case here, uh, land use data, uh, where the, uh, well, the, the land use is uh, mapped here, uh, and it's in a data set from the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs, and the data protection officer of this ministry says this data set is, uh, is personal data, and uh, you cannot automatically uh, inf include this in Inspire, you can only do that with a lot of uh, limitations. Um, because land use, if you link it to a, a cadastral uh, map, through the cadastral map you find the ownership, uh, the owner, and uh, well, uh, with the owner you have a natural data, natural person uh, and personal data. Um, if you go one step uh, further, then spatial data infrastructures, Inspire as a spatial data infrastructure, also there, Flanders. Uh, they had uh, well, the ultimate goal of a spatial data infrastructure to optimize the collection, maintenance, exchange, and use and reuse of geoinformation and geoinformation services specified in the law. And basically, anyone who is able to use the data can use the data. From an SDI perspective, the ideal. What did the Flemish Data Protection Agency rule? Um, many of the Inspire data sets, so within the uh, SDI, a lot of Inspire data sets were there. Uh, these should be considered personal data, following the same ruling as I already said. Uh, because of that, uh, you need to have well-defined uh, goals, and the goal, the ultimate uh, SDI goal, uh, was not specified enough. Also, the allowed use was way too abstract, and therefore uh, this uh, uh, data protection agency was unable to assess the need and proportionality of the use uh, re in relation to the SDI goals, and also uh, whether these, uh, the use potential use uh, was compatible or not with the initial purposes of the data processing. So a big problem over there. And it does not stop really there, because the uh, scope of the data protection age, uh, uh, directive uh, widens with the uh, advancements of uh, technology. So the more easy it is to link to a person, the more data uh, comes uh, into play and into the scope of the data protection uh, directive. So data that's considered today to be non-personal may, in the future, very near future, become uh, uh, personal data due to technological developments. So an example here, you see bits and pieces of uh, data sets uh, by themselves not uh, uh, personal data, you're not linking to a person, but with a lot of da data mining technology, you may be able to create quite a nice profile of a person that implies that each single part of the data of the data set that are included in this uh, picture are all personal data and should be uh, adhering to the law. At the same time, we see figures like this, uh, web mapping services of the past data set, uh, every month uh, over two, and a, two million uh, views um, for the past data set, for the building and address data set, 
uh, we see even more, over 10 million uh, views per, per, per month. And at the Dusk Raster, there has not been filed one single complaint about this. So you can say, if this is going to be uh, considered to be personal data, why are we not overstretching the scope of the data protection uh, directive? Um, that's the status uh, at this moment. As you may know, uh, there is a general data protection regulation uh, being drafted now. Uh, the Commission uh, is very happy with that. Uh, even the European Parliament agrees with it. Only the Council uh, sh uh, has to say yes. And is in this uh, da general data protection regulation, um, uh, the concept of personal data is not really changed, uh, but they specified it a little bit better. And well, I highlighted it already. Location data is there mentioned. So, um, well, s the people that know the e-privacy directive that know that location data is coming from uh, from the e-privacy directive relating to the most detailed location uh, of a mobile device. But in the general draft uh, data protection regulation, this is not specified. So it's not defined location data. And the interesting thing is that this uh, regulation is known, well known for the right to be forgotten. So does that mean if there is location data that's considered to be personal data uh, in your SDI, uh, should there be someone standing up, I want my house removed out of this data set, I want to be forgotten? Is this going to be the near future for us? I don't know. I hope it's not the truth, but we don't know. Conclusion, data protection legislation in Europe, uh, the, 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 the data protection uh, directive, but also the, the regulation that's coming up, uh, and Inspire may bite each other. And other than that, I only have questions. Um, is it possible to adhere to the uh, data protection objectives or uh, requirements and still fulfill the Inspire objectives? Does anonymous geodata exist? If you look at the picture of this, this, this man I created with all kinds of data sets, uh, if it exists, at what least level of detail can you guarantee anonymity? Probably not. Or should we argue here that data protection legislation in Europe uh, is going way beyond uh, its initial purpose to protect the privacy of individuals? It's very, in a nutshell, my presentation. I also want to draw attention to the work of the Global Spatial Data Infrastructure Association, where we are uh, exploring now uh, open license for geodata worldwide. And um, that's what we're going to do this year. If you do know open data licenses, uh, open licenses for geodata, please let me or your Promfoods uh, know we are chairing uh, this initiative. And for the, the last part of this year, we're also going to explore the applicability of data protection legislation to geodata. And we are gathering all kinds of uh, legal cases or opinions. Uh, so far, thank you. Thanks very much, Bastian. Right, any quick, any quick questions on this topic of data protection? How, to how many people was Bastian's presentation a surprise that such data could be considered within the remit and scope of the data protection legislation? Yeah, quite a few. Are you concerned? Yes. Yes? <laughs> yes. yes? Do you want to explain a little more? No, 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 not now. <laughs> Okay, so any, any specific questions? One at the back. I'm going to give you the microphone because we're recording everything, and if you could use that. Sure. Thanks. Just a very uh, simple question. My name is Martin Tuchinia. Uh, I was wondering whether under this initiative you mentioned on the last slide, uh, which, uh, which seems to be some sort of effort to provide some, some guidance for those who are producing the geospatial data and uh, as well as uh, using, is there some plan to also consider the outcomes of the Inspire licensing framework for this work for the near future, just to just to strengthen the, the usage of these licenses, uh, uh, maybe on the more than the European level? Yeah. Well, uh, this this work uh, I started together with uh, Kathleen Jans uh, two or three years ago, and we want to have the, the full uh, picture, the broad the broad scope of all licenses included. And uh, we, we uh, reviewed that, and it's, it's, for us, it appeared to be very difficult to harmonize 
all lenses that you can uh, can imagine. Uh, we, we draw uh, a framework uh, where, uh, well, we, we tried to make a first attempt to harmonize uh, all these lenses, these conditions, but that was uh, very difficult. Um, for now, we focus on open lenses uh, because there are also many many types of uh, open lenses. Each um, country is investigating or uh, uh, inventing its own lenses. Open government license, uh, geo shared in the Netherlands. In France, I saw uh, several uh, open lenses. You have Creative Commons. Many, many uh, uh, open lenses, and we want to explore. Uh, uh, what open licenses are uh, being uh, utilized across the world and trying to harmonize these uh, and maybe by providing the insight that are, they are using the same but a little bit different licenses uh, to make them move towards the step that they're going to use one single license because that in the end is what the user is uh, uh, really uh, waiting for. Okay, we're going to actually get into licenses a bit more in the next <laughs> couple of presentations. Yeah. Um, just while we're still on the data protection thing though, um, the changes to the definitions that Bastian was talking about are being discussed in the Commission at the moment. And I just wondered how many uh, people are aware of their member states perhaps trying to influence whether or not location data, as currently described, continues to be personal data with all the implications yeah. it's got for Inspire. Is anybody aware of activity to try and influence this? No. Well, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if the, if the analysis is active there, but uh, I'm also a member of the uh, Dutch Open Data Breakthrough Team, and we identified uh, barriers towards uh, the successful utilization of open data, and this is one of the, the, the major ba yeah. barriers we identified. And uh, our chairman, who's the CEO of uh, ESRI, uh, also put it forward to uh, the lobbyist uh, channels in, in, uh, in the Commission. So, I assume that the Netherlands is, uh, is addressing this also, yeah. yeah. We in the UK, we've had discussions with our Ministry of Justice, who are the lead department for the data protection legislation, because they were unaware of the implications of this for other parts of the legislative yeah. pattern. Is that a question about yeah, stopping? Question. Yeah, thank you very much. Christian Anzaga from the Environment Agency. Um, uh, it was it was one of the few who was not surprised that uh, especially satellite images and remote sensing data uh, are in conflict with personal uh, data protection. On what other fields which Inspire is uh, is listing uh, do you expect uh, impact in terms of uh, com conflicts with personal data protection? Well, we other than uh, remote sensing. Well, I already put the uh, building and address data, uh, cadastral parcels, uh, uh, even the land use uh, is now being discussed uh, as, as being, being tricky. Uh, in the end, uh, basically all data uh, can be considered personal data as long as you can link it with the personal, personal uh, data. And, uh, that's the, that's the, the the frustrating thing uh, you may be uh, think, or the the inconvenient part of the data protection legislation as it is at, uh, at the moment. So if I get it right, from your point of view, the key uh, the key piece uh, is the is the cadastral parcel, which law, or which, the or which the address to, or from a, from a, from a property to the to the property owner. That's okay. one of the key uh, identifiers, you could say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Quick one, very, very quick one run, then we'll move on to the next uh, presentation. So in some countries, is there not conflict here with data that's a matter of public record and maybe has been for centuries? So land ownership is often uh, a public record and it's a matter of the exchange of property that it has to be as such. So this, this notion of linking and what you can do for things, is there an element, I'm, I'm being respectful as well, but is there an element of paranoia? Because once uh, geodemographics uh, work that tries to profile communities and understand the, the, the structure of communities and its social economic makeup uh, is a very useful tool for analytical purposes. But if you were to talk to people outside of an academic context or experience in the companies who do this kind of thing, people would be horrified that this kind of profiling goes on. So I'm trying to sense a balance here between data that, that really is about the person and data that relate, relates to the things that you do, 
I'm not a lawyer, so I don't understand how maybe that could be interpreted, especially across different countries in Europe. Because I appreciate maybe in Germany, I remember Google were taking some photographs in Street View, and they were using some ladders or particularly high cameras, and people were objecting because they were having photographs taken of their gardens that were seen as a private space rather than the public space. So I know I've raised several points, but the point is, is all of it really personal data? Uh, what is really personal that, 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 that really uh, uh, depends on, on your interpretation uh, of the law and uh, the data protection agencies are, are taking the, the one side and you can maybe take another side, but uh, when the data protection uh, 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 regulations uh, apply, it doesn't say that it doesn't allow anything. Cadastro ownership information uh, is there for a specific purpose. And for a specific purpose, uh, making uh, well, the transparency of the, the housing market or something that is a, a, an objective why uh, this information is publicly available and accessible for everybody. And that's a specified explicit purpose. But if you're looking at uh, SDI in general, uh, we are collecting and sharing data and everybody can use the data. That's not specific and not explicit, uh, not enough. <laughs> Uh, and maybe you, you can work on that. So if something is personal, that doesn't apply, uh, imply that you cannot do anything with it, but there are some boundaries there uh, with what you can do with the data. Uh, but for the, for the definition of what personal data really is, uh, well, I just submitted a, a PC proposal uh, to figure that out, so to, to come with alter alternatives, uh, because it's a very, very difficult uh, concept, uh, especially the way they're presenting it now in the, in the legislation. Okay, thanks very much, Ben. I'm going to uh, close down questions on this now, but I'm hoping there'll be time later for some further questions on this topic. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll call on uh, Daria Lichtenegger now to come and uh, to cover the data and service sharing challenges in ISPAR, which I know something about, but I'm interested to see what's been happening in the last couple of years. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So my name is Daria Lichtenegger, and this presentation is prepared together with my colleague Christian Ansorge, who is sitting right there, and I think that he will be available for some questions later on as well. So um, European Environment Agency is, is involved in, at the European level in the coordination of inspired development and since 2013 we took over a little bit more activities related to the inspired data and service sharing and this is my starting point from which I, I made this, uh, we made this presentation. Uh, so I will present what was the initial problem in data and service sharing, how the sharing is addressed by Inspire Directive, what kind of improvements we can already see in data and service sharing related to Inspire today, but we have to face certain obstacles, what kind of obstacles, and how to move forward to even improve the data and service sharing. So the initial problem about the data uh, to the access, uh, how to gain the access to the data and how to exchange and use them was already identified uh, during the preparation of Inspire Directive. Uh, and it was recognized that uh, these obstacles actually uh, ca uh, are coming from very different areas. So those are cultural, institutional, financial, and legal barriers that can prevent the, or delay the sharing and reuse of existing spatial data. To overcome this initial problem, Inspire Directive sets two important principles. Uh, the first one is that, the, that uh, it is possible to, for the spatial data collected at one level of the public authority to be shared between other public authorities, and that the spatial data are made available in a certain way, in such a way that un, and in, under such conditions, that those conditions do not restrict their extensive use. So in the Inspire Directive, we have several places where data and service sharing is mentioned. The scope of the sharing is actually defined in the Article 4.1, uh, saying that this is the, the special data in a digital form rel related to the Inspire special data teams within the areas of jurisdictional rights of the member states. The Article 17 then specifically defines that the member states have to implement the measures for the sharing of data between the public authorities and that they have to open those measures to the public authorities of other member states, community institutions and bodies and the partners of international organizations to which they are the members. 
But in addition to this sharing between the public administration, public authorities, we have Article 11, which says that certain network services has to be open and available to the public. And that among the network services, we have uh, discovery, view, downloads, transformation, invoke services. And uh, there is also a specific implementing rule setting the harmonized conditions under which the in community institutions and bodies can access the data of the member states. So these are the legal bases for the data and service sharing to inspire. So, based on the recent evaluation in 2013 and 14, um, on different information, what kind of improvements we actually see in this in, uh, since the initial problem? We can see that information of the conditions for access and use of special data sets and services are much more available through the metadata of the data sets and services, and we have much more metadata today than we had before. Uh, several licenses are already published uh, directly on the website, so we can access them, read them, and understand the conditions, or they can be generated through the applications, through the applications on the website. Uh, in addition, in many cases, there are general licensing agreements and more general licensing models adopted, which uh, overcomes the, the, the traditional one-to-one -one contract for the sharing of data. And this uh, saves certain time and also the cost of maintaining of such, uh, such agreements. However, in particular, based on the country reports that uh, were collected in 2013, and they present a period of uh, between 2010 and 2012, a lot of member states, a lot of countries declared a lot, several obstacles, which are here grouped in, uh, in few groups. So we can see that they really belong from the perspective of member states to several areas, legal, financial, cooperation, but also specific knowledge, technical, and the, the questions of licensing issues which contribute to the barriers. If we look into the technical and licensing issues, by my opinion, these are two areas where we can establish certain harmonization level at the, between the countries, because all other obstacles are probably much more related to the legal framework of, in, of, of a country or the, to the specific organizational cultural conditions in the countries. So if we would work on these two areas, and if we look into more, into more detail what kind of obstacles the countries proposed, we can see that they are coming at the technical level from the different uh, legal systems that have to be changed to, to, to adapt to the modern SDI infrastructure, to the difficulties with the implementation of web service technology, lack of knowledge, quality of data, uh, of uh, data metadata and services, and maybe difficulty of the complexity of the Inspire, of the Inspire specifications. On the other side, from the licensing point of view, we have problems like heterogeneity of licensing models, different sharing products, uh, requirement that this is modernized all the time. Uh, the big issue is actually on the, uh, on the restrictions that are applied. This means on the charges for the data, on the, the, the data available to certain user groups under specific conditions. You cannot use them after the end of the license and so on and so on. Um, of course, we have also a little bit the, the resistance to share data, but this, as we can see, is maybe getting a little bit lower. So, we think that actually these two problems could be, these two problematic areas could be provided, could be, um, could be discussed further on within the Inspire Maintenance and, and Implementation Group, which is now the group for further maintenance and evaluation of Inspire. And for this purpose, already a specific work package to deal with data and service sharing is, is part of this work, rolling work program. And this work package should bring the national experiences, practices, and needs together with the needs of the, of the, of the European perspective with the access to the data and services of the member states for the purpose to improve the usability of the information of the licenses and also to evaluate what kind of technical means could be implemented to even support further improvement of, uh, of licensing, uh, uh, of sharing. So the initial discussions in this, uh, um, in this MIC already started and uh, 
and we identified um, a few steps of our, in, uh, let's say, few, few interest topics. First one would be the work on the classification of the constraints and conditions. So not that, that much on the harmonization of licenses, but to have a classification of different licensing conditions that exist, which could be presented in a more clear and usable and user-friendly way to the users to understand actually what the license is all about. And this work will be also, we see that close connections further on with the metadata information about the data sets and services, which, where actually this information should be published. The second part, as a step, uh, the step after this initial step, would be the steps toward the machine readable licenses. So the current, the current situation in MIC is uh, uh, what it's, it's actually the, the, the wrap up of the, of the initial topics that were discussed at the Inspire MIC meeting in April 2014. And the next steps we see in Inspire MIC will be to have a proposal for, to set up the terms of reference to establish a subgroup which will work on this work program, on this work package. So the call to, for the nomination of the experts in this subgroup will be published, then the project plan for the work will be prepared, the kickoff activities will start, and what will be important task of this uh, subgroup activities in MIC will be to keep coordination with other activities in this work program to keep the connections with metadata and services and some other technical developments which can contribute to better uh, licensing and of course uh, data sharing as well. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daria. Um, the following presentation is also about licensing, but before we move on, are there any uh, specific questions for Daria on the, the, the what the MIG is likely, sorry, the MIG group is likely to do in this particular area, or, or whether their priorities are in the right place? Obviously, you've got it. It looks like you're getting it right in that case. <laughs> Any other questions for Daria before I move on? Okay, well, we'll come back to um, some time for questions on the licensing aspect after the next presentation, which is from Rene. So just move your presentation on. Okay, so this is, whoops, <laughs> Rennie, Rennie Lura, who is going to give us an example of how licenses can be harmonized, I think, I hope. Yes. Yeah, Daria. Uh, yeah, Claire. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. My name is René Lura. I'm from the German Geo Business Commission, and I would like to present you the possibility to license uh, governmental data. So, I will start with some basic information, what we do and who we are. We are um, installed by the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy in 2004 and we are located at the Federal Institute for Geoscience and Natural Resources and the members of the Commission are mostly from German economy like energy, water, real estate, natural resources and what we do is to find out what, how governmental data can be available, can be made available for the economy to use. So we have different methods. First method is talking, talking with two different partners on the administration side, on the economic side, with uh, different uh, interests and uh, we try to evaluate the problems and the things who are working in uh, lead projects, in, in in uh, lead projects and on this we develop tools to make data available from the government and one of these tools is the so-called geolicense and in this context I will show you shortly how our commission was embedded in the national and the international and the global community uh, in Copernicus, GEOS, and uh, we're working strongly together with the German Special Data Infrastructure, the so-called 
PDEDA steering committee and so we are working together to make data available with different interests. So in the initial situation it's a little bit hard formulated I guess but there are many problems who, which we evaluated concerning data quality, availability, data providers, pricing, licensing and data protection. And these problems are generated from German structure, from the German government structure with one federation, 16 states and over 10,000 or 11,000 municipalities. So you can imagine you are a you have a, a, a business model and you want to use governmental data and you have to negotiate with everybody of these data holders the license. So at the end of the day it's possible that you have a library full of licenses and the negotiation of these licenses costs a little bit of time. So in cooperation with this uh, GDEDA, with the spatial data, uh, data uh, spatial infrastructure of Germany and the, the wishes of the economy, we developed a so-called geolicense. It's a click tool over the web with which the administrative uh, government data could be available for economy. So, to make this easy for you, Easy for me. How it works. Hello, I'm geolicense.org, the license service of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, specially developed as a service for German economy and administration. I'm here to help licensing your geo information. Nowadays, these data are the basis of various business models. New business areas are encouraged to form and along the way many new jobs arise. How does it work? Are you a state, local, or federal authority? If you have geodata, you can use the free service from geolizenz.org for your contracts. According to current EU law, in Germany, these are the geodata access laws. Companies are entitled to work with all geodata as of now. At first, this sounds like a lot of work and expense for you, and a lot of different contracts. More and more users will be coming to you. More and more geo products will be in use. More and more new business models will emerge. Federal authorities, lots of state authorities, and about 12,000 local authorities. No company can close that many contracts. It's too much work. No business can develop like that. But a company needs licenses because it has to be able to rely on the provision of data. Phew, that sounds like a lot of work. No way. My standardized licensing policy takes a whole load of work off your shoulders. Now you can have standardized terms of use, reliable contracts and professional management of all your geo information licenses. And you'll get this absolutely free of charge as a government service. Of course, you still have to provide your own geo information. You only specify user groups, type of use and, if needed, the price of your product. When a company wants your geo product and clicks the order button, the order ends up with me and, as long as the profile of user and product corresponds, I'll send your license agreement to the company. They receive the link to your data in return. But is all of my data secure on geolicense.org? Yes, it's safe. And you can take data protection into account by checking the user's legal authorization. I offer eight different types of license covering any case you can imagine, thus enabling companies to use your highly accurate and sensitive data. And what do I have to do to use geolicense.org? Is the system easy? It's so easy. Just sign up as a provider, register your product and attach the license type of your choice. If you want, you can assign additional attributes like data protection, price and password. And that's it. As for the user, the company, everything happens automatically. Why is all this necessary? There are many business models that want to or must work with your data, but only if products go under easy to use and standardized licenses, reasonable data protection and fair market prices. 
This way, companies can be established and strengthened, jobs can be created and secured. That's why. Get in. Presentation, but it's uh, it makes no. Uh, it's uh, it's okay. Yeah. I have I have one slide left, uh, which I would like to show. And So this, uh, this click service was established uh, in the fall last year. In this uh, spring on the CBIT we added the e-payment component so that you can offer your licenses if they have a, a payment component over PayPal. And in the future we want to evaluate the usability. How do the administration work with this? How do they want to work with this? And uh, and further integration into the German SDI. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rene. Was, I enjoyed that. That was fun. <laughs> um, right, we've had two presentations on on the more on the licensing aspects. Um, have we got questions relating to licensing and how we might harmonise this? There's one over here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, René. Uh, one question is uh, how successful has this uh, standard license you offer? It is a standardized license which should replace legacy li uh, licenses uh, by administrations. So I would assume it is rather used uh, and accepted if I come with a new product. Uh, what is your experience with, uh, for example, public administrations and service providers in changing their legacy license? This, which is actually the problem because we still have a lot of uh, heterogeneous legacy licenses with, for example, I remember a, a quick survey where I checked some German license models which go deep into, into local uh, and regional law uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's not so easy to simply accept this for the public administration. What is your experience in this you are, sector? You are right. This is uh, difficult and uh, the way is to, to talk, to talk and to repeat, to talk and to repeat and hoping of an avalanche with a small piece and uh, that it is, it is was established la last year. So uh, our job is to, to communicate it into the administrative, that, they, that there is a possibility to use this and it's the easy way and uh, yeah, the way is, is very long to communicate and to repeat that it is possible to, to make it easy to license the data. Yeah, I, give it, I give it back to you, but this was uh, too short thinking, I'm sorry. I had a second part of the question, I forgot. Uh, how, is, uh, how is this uh, connected to uh, the basic Inspire uh, and the specific Inspire license which already exist? Or is this just another, well, not just another, but uh, is it again a specific standardized license or did you take into consideration the li standard licenses which are already proposed? In its origin, it's based on Creative Commons and was uh, de developed together with, uh, with the admi administrative and governmental part of Germany to come to a conclusion how um, very different opinions on licensing data can put together on this. This is the first step. And uh, licensing on Inspire regulations, I think I would l wouldn't like to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks a lot. I would have uh, one question for Daria and one for you, if I may. Uh, first of all, for this solution, really, thanks a lot for a very interesting business model behind. I was wondering uh, whether uh, for the future you are not planning to extend this coverage also for the other sectors like private, academia, even NGOs. Mm. I think this is quite uh, interesting uh, potential for the future. Yeah. And uh, I was not sure the current application is only in German language or you can also right. have it on the only German. in Germany, yeah. Okay. And the second question for uh, Daria, uh, did you did you receive some feedback from the member states for this activity and if uh, uh, are there some plans where this group realistically should should start to work or it's still too soon to to say some some dates? Uh, yeah. Who's okay. going first? Yeah. <laughs> there were two questions I think so I don't know. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I thought it was a question to Daria, and I was. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this other extension into other sectors was the question. Uh, for the sectors, yeah. Um, yeah, this is step after step. We, we start with the administrative, and uh, uh, in the next step, uh, now we, we, are, we are trying to. Uh, um, how it is possible to get data from, um, from companies uh, from the energy and water sector. And their, uh, and their needs about the INSPIRE directive to make their data INSPIRE conform. And this was the next step. The first step was only the administrative and governmental data. Daria, would you like to respond to your question? Uh, thank you. So I, I suppose you mean uh, activities you see in INSPIRE MIG, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I meant this uh, uh, so, as I shortly present where we are in this Inspire Meek, we had these initial discussions. Now it is the time to prepare the terms of reference because this is the starting point which will be discussed within Meek and the basis when this is adopted, the call to establish the subgroup will be launched. And we, we would try hard to do this as soon as possible uh, and that this activity can, can actually start when the subgroup will be, uh, will be composed and when the subgroup will have more clear project plan. What I was hoping today was to get all the certain ideas or the needs, the views that you will have that could be a good discussion point in this Inspire, further on in Inspire MIG. Uh, however, the initial topics were already indication of several countries that this is actually the, the burden area for them, that they see that, that um, uh, uh, a lot of users who have, who have now access to metadata and when they see the conditions in, in, described in metadata, they don't understand them. So we need, uh, and they are different from metadata to metadata, from data provider to data provider, from country to country. So we need another level which will be more clear, which will more clear, clearly provide at least uh, uh, some sort of common conditions which we can find under which to which licenses can be mapped just to present them as a first place to the user. This was the initial idea to work on. Thank you. Bastian? I think I have a lot of questions, but one of the major questions that's coming to my mind is, uh, you, you said it's based on Creative Commons. Mm. Uh, I have a deja vu of what we did in the Netherlands, also based on Creative Commons. And uh, we got a feedback now from our users uh, that uh, it's very nice what you did based on Creative Commons, but uh, why are you not using Creative Commons? Um, and we did an, uh, a check of uh, our Dutch uh, geo portal, where six or seven thousand data sets are included. Uh, it appeared to be that it's Creative Commons, Creative Commons, and Creative Commons that's mm -hmm. now being used. And the special thing that we uh, developed was now only for 50 data sets out of five, six thousand data sets. So, how much is your geo license being used? Uh, and is uh, the system interoperable with? Uh, creative Commons licenses. Why we don't use directly Creative Commons is that we want to guarantee um, a data access about 12 months. Then when you get a, a license, you get it for 12 months guaranteed when you sign it. This is the first part. And the second part is that uh, in our opinion, uh, Creative Commons do not, ex do not too much focus on, uh, on geodata. And, uh, and especially on the, 
on the purposes of uh, data protection and uh, privacy policy. This is one of the next steps to get data available for economy to solve these problems, which are you present to. Well, we, we had discussions about uh, data protection in, uh, in the LFC uh, 2.0, illegal aspects of public information mm. project, uh, mm. about licensing uh, data protection rules. Mm. And uh, the, the experts over there said, well, that's not a good, not a good idea. Mm. Uh, just leave it in the legislation, don't do it in licenses. Mm. Uh, so maybe that's a uh, thing to reconsider. Uh, mm. I can br bring you in contact with these people uh, mm. that are uh, focusing on that. Uh, but yeah, but I have many, many other questions, but uh, it, it's a good way, but I think in the end uh, we really should go into a, a global framework and, and linking into that and not uh, creating our national uh, uh, models. But that's uh, uh, my deja vu uh, standpoint. <laughs> it's only one possibility. It's, yeah. it's not, the, not, not, the, not the last license uh, to, uh, to, to offer. <laughs> uh. Can I have just a quick comment or quick question? Um, usually we come across uh, a problem when we combine two data sets with different licenses. Uh, do you have any recommendations or have you thought about it when people will take uh, one data set with, with one license and another data set with different license, when they will combine it? What license will it have in the end? And you will combine it in a way that you can't separate the data. You can't mm. say, oh, this number or this feature mm. is from this data set mm. and this from this data set. Yeah. If, if you have just some thoughts about it or if you have some recommendations for that. Thank you. You are right, this is a problem. But uh, I have to say uh, that's not our problem because we are only serving the license. And your, the problem you are mentioned or you are pointed out are on the provider side how to manage how uh, he is, uh, uh, yeah, he has to, to manage this problem. And, uh, yeah. Certainly a common problem, the more data yeah. gets put together, as we all know, that's, that's why we put data together, to get more value from it, but it raises other issues. Um, when the MIG group gets going, I'm assuming that it's going to look around and, and look for ideas that are currently happening and this is one that will be taken in. But are there any other uh, national solutions to this problem that anyone would like to share with us as to how to deal with the uh, heterogeneity of licensing? Very short uh, addition to actually what Daria asked, some sort of proposal. I think for us it's a very urgent topic, I mean, back in Slovakia. We already established some discussions and one of the realistic solutions so far for the geospatial domain seems to be at least to take this, uh, the, the main players on the scene, I mean from the licensing point of view, and, and not uh, to harmonize them, but really at least to create some sort of mapping. That if some public uh, body decides to use the Inspire licenses, yeah, they are free to use that. But at the same time, we have some providers who would be happy to have the, the, the same data uh, somehow labeled with the CC licenses. So what we are planning to do, to do is a sort of simple mapping between the elements in the Inspire licenses to CC licenses. And this can be first step towards this future, hopefully, harmonization. So, yeah. Okay, I think, did, did you want to talk about <laughs> Oh, all right, okay. Uh, so it's my time, I'm meeting up. So just to plug another presentation, uh, tomorrow morning at nine, I'm chairing a session on uh, urban-related issues, but we fitted, and I managed to fit in another presentation from another ISA action that's looking at open data licensing and a variation of that as well. Because open data doesn't just mean it's free to use. There's a whole variation of licensing there, and we're lucky somebody from one of the eyes actions is able to share that with us that couldn't be here today. So, uh, is it me next then? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, we're going to move on because of uh, well, time. Um, I'm hoping there will be some time at the end for to catch up with any questions. So, sorry about that. We'll hopefully pick it up later. Before I forget as well, uh, just in terms of the, the legal uh, background to what I'm about to talk about, it's more the Article 13 
in the directive to do with access control. Uh, and there's all sorts of very reasonable reasons why that may take place. Um, this is really work by others that I obviously want to acknowledge. So uh, we're lucky as well to have the consortium leader for this work, uh, Dirk Freen, in the uh, audience today. He's, he's essentially the, the technical coordinator of a lot of this work. Uh, and we're supported by a number of experts uh, here, some of whom I'll also mention at the end of the presentation. Uh, so I'll give you a very quick overview uh, of what's going on here. Um, we've got several activities in ARENA that were meant to be uh, things that are missing from the overall functioning of uh, the Inspire architecture, and we already presented some of this uh, in uh, the session on the MIG just before this session. Uh, and so it mainly fits in with uh, Work Package 3. But essentially, uh, uh, what we've asked in the first instance of this work on access control is to review some of the standards and some of the technologies involved uh, towards the development of a test bed uh, that's being put in place in, in real, live, living, Inspire and e-government related communities. Uh, and I also take a, an opportunity to thank the consortium for the efforts so far. So being brief. Uh, there's a number of things that we're doing, but clearly access control related issues. If you look at the middle of the screen here on the right hand side where I've got AAA, this is the part of Inspire that we're helping with, alongside of a number of other things that are in other presentations at this year's conference. So uh, what we wanted to do here was look at access control from more of a real technical experience point of view and not deal with so much of the licensing and legal issues, uh, partly for reasons of maturity, but also because we saw other things coming and that's where it's very interesting, the work that Daria and, uh, and colleagues are involved in. Uh, as well as, of course, some of the presentations you've been listening to in this session. So we want to identify and assess the current standards that are being used around uh, geospatial data, but also in a wider context of e-government to do with uh, what's called secure data exchange. It's sometimes called access control. Terminology is something I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, also identify potentially some best practices in other sectors. Um, involve stakeholders. We had a workshop in March. Uh, develop this test bed uh, using open source tools as much as possible. We want this to be reusable in the sense that this lesson should also be extensible and you should be able to repeat it and to collect feedback from those involved. Um, again, it's mainly a technical activity to do with uh, interoperability. That's one of the main purposes of the ISA program that we belong to. But there are also a number of organizational and social issues that have emerged already through this work, and that's what I'd like to share with you as well today. So the favored approach, the approach that's being taken in the test bed, that's already been tested in-house between the members of the consortium. So they actually set up the technical testing of access to data in different organizations. is already being implemented with the organizations that are participating in the work. So I guess roughly in September, October, we should have uh, some conclusions of how that's actually worked in practice. Um, but essentially, it's a kind of access management federation. And that's a federation where you have local authorization uh, plus uh, a network of organizations uh, that are involved in sharing protected resources within this agreed federation. And this is where a user authenticates themselves with their organization before being allowed access to uh, the resources of a service provider. There's a nice diagram coming up in a second that maybe explains this better. There are a number of attributes here about users that can be used, uh, but it should be very important in this process, also, I guess, partly because of Bass comments, that. When you're trying to access these resources, a lot of the personal information involved should not be exchanged. So the idea is the organization maybe that you work for says that you're the right type of person to be able to access some of the resources. Now, uh, this also involves service providers hosting uh, OGC services. That's what makes it partly geo. This is the, the testing approach here. And also there's some work done around a client to be able to show how uh, the actual access process works. And this is part of the test, uh, test bed as well. <clears throat> So this is the diagram I mentioned. So essentially, the little uh, black juggler character is, is one of the users, and they belong to a particular organization. And uh, that they will be provided with an identity by that organization, and they'll be able to access services. And the only thing I really want to point to in this particular slide is the blue bubble in the middle about a coordinating center. Uh, for this kind of federation to work, you need a coordinating center. 
and uh, we're not the first to come up with this and I've probably actually stolen this slide in the end uh, because some work certainly been done already in terms of the OGC and there's some work being done already in Germany that this is being built on but as well uh, uh, the experience that I'd seen as already, already as a user is this is a lot of work done in research community and in academic circles so the UK Federation to access geographical information if you're in a UK university is exactly through this type of approach. So I give you some sense of some standards here. Uh, it's the authorization ones I bring you to in the third row uh, in terms of ZACAMIL and GeoSACAMIL, so that's authorization, as well security standards uh, in the orange box on the right hand side SAML. And at this point I should point out there's a report that's going to be uh, reviewed and produced all about this. So I'm going through this quickly because hopefully the report will be there for you to read large extended annex all about the standards, describing their characteristics, etc. But I'll just give you another quick feel about this and some of the issues we're already coming across. So one of the first things is that a lot of the security also is based on standard internet technologies, so HTTPS that you probably all recognize, even non-technical people like me, uh, this is a way in which you're securely authorized to access things. But as well in auth authentication in particular, uh, SAML is involved, but what we also see is uh, there's some trade-off here between some different standards. SAML may be complex, but it works with technologies like Shibboleth. OpenID is fairly popular, but there's some issues here about not having a trustee list, so the federation issue maybe doesn't work as well. Uh, similarly, for authorization, uh, ZACAML and uh, GeoZACAML are complex, uh, OAuth, I think that's how you pronounce it, is simple, but then you can't be sophisticated about the kind of rights that you issue. So uh, the other good news with this type of work, although we weren't specifically looking into licensing, uh, the experts involved in the standards, particularly Andreas Mateus, who's involved in drafting some of the OGC standards, uh, he also included in the review some of these policy and licensing standards uh, for your consideration too. Uh, and just to mention, this work was also presented at the OGC meeting uh, last week. And not by me, I hasten to ask, so thank you to colleagues for that work. Um, so the review of t technologies actually is broader. There's a longer list than the review of standards. Um, there's a number of areas here, and I can't really explain the specific technologies, but I just want to give you a sense. Again, it's in the report that we have a particular technology that could be involved, but essentially we come down to uh, SAML 2 being quite an important part of the standards involved, and that leads us to a particular technological approach. Um, the endpoints that, that SAML 2 offers, it's important for Inspire, but it's also quite an important part of the interoperability in general and that's also where we borrow uh, some of the experience from the ISA program as a whole which deals with a lot of the access control technologies for the Commission. Um, one of the useful sources for those immediately wanting to look up some of the technologies that have been reviewed recently uh, in this context is the Cantara initiative and uh, this is the, the link to their work at the top and they already uh, reviewed several different types of products both open source and proprietary and they find out that most of them uh, deal with authentication for SAML, uh, some for OpenID and some for OpenAuth. Uh, of which some also do ZACAML, and that there are a range of toolkits involved, and some are mentioned here. So what they've actually started to develop in the testbed is a shibboleth-based approach, and that's because, again, this relationship and the sophistication of the rights management that can take place uh, as I mentioned, it's already been tested in academic context. It's also been tested in the agile developments. So I think what's important here is they're, they're not just immediately jumping to a particular solution. It's an appropriate approach to be able to test this, uh, appro uh, this way of dealing with access control with real organizations and not just an experimental uh, approach for academic purposes, shall we say. Now the other reason for choosing this approach is it's scalable and they've already done some estimates that there could be roughly 2,000 service providers involved in this type of federation. Uh, we have no way really to understand the actual uh, level of estimate here if this is a good estimate or not. And we also don't know in the end in Inspire how many services need to be protected. And I'll come back to that in the conclusions in a minute or so. So I mentioned other practices in the ISA program. Here's two in particular. Uh, if anybody of you has used ACAS, 
uh, to log into Commission services. That's part of the ISA programme and it's, it's an example uh, of some of these uh, AAA tools. And the other one uh, is involved in electronic ID. So looking at ways of uh, allowing access uh, to systems uh, using uh, EIDs, um, particularly those based around roles. So that relates to some of those attributes I referred to earlier. And uh, what's interesting here, I think, in the longer term, is that there's an European e-government approach to access systems and tools that relate to commission activities. And that might be a very important thing to keep an eye on in the future as we implement INSPIRE. So just to mention briefly, uh, what are the outcomes of the workshop uh, in the first instance that we held in March? Um, we got inputs to the initial design for the test bed and some use cases. Um, we know that standards vary now, and we know that SAML isn't just one choice of standard, it's an entire framework. There are different levels and flavors of SAML, and the, the use cases that you're doing actually determine uh, the type of profile in SAML that you're choosing. So it's a lot more sophisticated, therefore it's also more complicated than we first realized, and that was very educational for all of us involved in the workshop. And we also know that there's maybe some dependencies in this approach and the technologies being used. I didn't mention before, uh, one real advantage here is you're building on top of existing infrastructure. So you're not replacing tools here. And this was a very important part of the work that's being done. The other thing we realized by combining e-government access control specialists and INSPIRE ones, or geospatial ones at least, there's a huge range of terminology and it's different. We had a good 20 minute conversation or potentially argument about what we actually meant when we were talking about these things. Consequence of this is, we can't just go to the standard ICT communities and say, help us. We've got a lot of explaining to do, and we also have so, do have some particular needs for accessing geospatial data. So the approach that's been taken since the workshop, and it's been moving forward, I think, quite quickly, is step-by-step -step learning by doing, along with these participating organizations, uh, especially those from, the Bel from Belgium and Germany and the Netherlands, who are the original team involved. Uh, the JRC have joined the experiment. We're gonna be involved in a more machine-to-machine -machine harvesting approach, rather than just authenticating a, a real person user. Plus, we actually have some observers uh, that some of the people who came to participate in the project have been following the development since uh, and also we've recently been talking to the ELF project because some aspects of their work also relate to access control. So uh, a personal thanks to me, for, uh, to Dirk, to allow us to encourage other people to come in and, and be able to follow on from the workshop. And another special thanks goes to uh, Benjamin Kotzel, who uh, drafted some reports himself on the basis of the outcomes of this and we're able to share it with uh, Eurogeographics colleagues. So here's my last slide and just a couple of ongoing issues that we've recognized from this work. Um, first of all, the report itself, it's going into a process with the MIG to be shared with some experts before we release. This gives us a chance to have a, a good review with experts. Uh, although we have some in-house in the GRC, uh, this is a, a good way to get some more feedback. Uh, I think I've made the message quite clear. Uh, there's huge benefits in, and it's been put into practice in the academic sector, but what we're talking about is quite a complex activity. And there's certainly a certain need uh, to have specific skills and able to set up this kind of activity. That's a big learning experience from the team that's been doing this work already. Uh, and there's also particular skills in setting up a geographical one. So there's no simple solution sitting out there in the government ready for us to pick up. Now, the other th side of this is the people who are in your organization and give you your passwords maybe have some experience here or the technical uh, companies, etc., that support you, but the service providers may have less. And that, of course, presents a challenge in an INSPIRE context where if you are an organization with a production environment and you're a traditional data producer publisher, you probably have some notions about how to do this yourself. But if you're somebody who's been less familiar with data publishing, etc., cetera, uh, data manufacturing and, and see yourself really as a source of data, maybe you have more challenges here and maybe you need to hire in expertise. And we're not oblivious to the issue of the costs here. So we may be having a technical solution that's maybe not um, easy to justify financially. But again, the point of this study is to see what we can do technically and understand the implications of the technical work. Uh, last uh, couple of points, it is also difficult to estimate what those setup costs could be. 
uh, so not putting together a very convincing argument in the moment, but this is again uh, a technical exploration. Uh, costs for different actors and costs for the setup as a whole. Although, again, we can look into this. We don't know this currently. We could look into this in terms of the academic and research world experience. However, as I said, these other approaches could be interesting. We should certainly be following what they're doing in European e-government. And by that, I mean mainly the work in the ISA program. And just a lot, the last couple of thoughts for consideration here. Um, what we came out with, at least for the people participating in the workshop, is that not all services are going to need access control. And also that access control or AAA can be an afterthought. There were a couple of countries that went for a very quick practical solution for their data needs immediately that are a very different approach to what would be a more uh, all-encompassing federation that I've been talking about today. Um, we also should uh, bear in mind that there is actually a spirit, uh, shall we say, of uh, open data uh, emerging and we shouldn't be looking at ways of closing off and restricting access to data. This is not the purpose of the work that we're doing. It's recognizing that, for example, uh, protected sites data could be accessible to certain people under certain conditions, but how do you do that on a European level? I think that's, that's part of the story, but not necessarily restricting all data. That would be uh, counterproductive to other policies like open data. And what we want to do, therefore, is go and get further experiences, and that's definitely coming through, as I mentioned, the testbed work that will be uh, coming to its main conclusions in the autumn. So that's it from me from now. Again, thank you so much uh, to some people I have to mention, uh, Anne Crade, who drafted the first report of this work with her colleague Danny, uh, Andreas Matthias for his work on the standards, uh, Dirk for coordinating the technical group uh, with his colleague Frank, and also some of the technical development work around the client, uh, particularly the issues that Ray are raised here. They've all been incredibly valuable, and thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, if there's any question on clarification, we'll take it now, but otherwise we'll hold questions on AAA until after the next presentation, because we're going to hear about an example of setting up a trust federation next. So are there any quick questions on that? Otherwise, we'll have questions for Robin and Marcus later. Right. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. I'm directly following up for Robin, um, and we have also participated in these workshops he was mentioning. Um, so I am from the NMC in Austria, and in fact, I'm talking for the coordination body of Inspire in Austria, so for all geodata providers there. And we do have something like um, authentication, authorization, accounting portal that we use, all authorities use. Um, so therefore, I will go through this Austrian Trust Federation. What is it? How do we use it? What are the use cases and what are the experiences, like in the NMCA in Austria? Um, what are the services that we put into there? What are the functions that we um, embed into this system? Um, why do we need something like this? Um, we know that we try to ease the access and usage of data and services. Uh, we make it transparent. But on the other side, um, there may be the need um, to regulate the access to this information. In terms of privacy, we have heard something like this. In terms of business processes, um, and in terms of maybe protection of infrastructure that we run. So you may track the users that access your systems and you will need to know who is the user, especially if you look at the cadastro, you will need to know who is the person looking at these properties. Um, so there comes out the requirement for a single sign-on solution and of course a federated identity management um, that became obvious for Austria in 2001. We are federated, it's a very small country, about 80,000 square kilometers, but nevertheless we have more than 2,400 municipalities 118 counties and nine federated states. Um, so that's federated, and if you don't keep it in mind, then you have a system like this with a non-federated identity management where the users have accounts for each of these authorities they have to deal with. So that's getting very complicated and time-spending very soon. Um, 
Additionally, you are lacking a uniform standard among these partners and collaborations between these authorities do not exist. So there's the need for this federated identity management in order to have one single ID, one home institution, accessing the different functionalities of the different authorities. Um, the Austrian Trust Federation um, has the focus on authentication, authorization, accounting, and there are three components that we are focusing at or that we use, which is the so-called user portal, or the identity provider, as Robin said, um, the application portal, which is the service provider, providing the functionalities, and the most important thing in between, the multilateral contract. So there needs to be a contract between all participants that allows the service providers to trust the authentication. So the service provider needs to trust the authentication and the authorization and accounting information passed to them from the identity providers. So this is tr trust statement is the central contract that is needed in order to make the system running. Um, the change of notions just took place because we were integrating SAML2 um, and therefore we standardized or we um, used the standards that were used for these um, uh, notions. So that's the genesis. Um, the main killer need that was observed or that make, made this Austrian Trust Federation um, that showed up the requirement for the Austrian Trust Federation was the central residence register. So the central residence register showed up that you need something like a federated approach. And this was the initial point in 2001. And the first um, Trust Federation portal started in 2005. And since then, um, this application was developed further on. Um, yes, I've said this, the main um, driving motivo motivation behind was to delegate the identity proofing, so the authentication and the authorization. What is the status up to now? Um, all ministries, federal state administrations and local communities administrations are accessing this federation portal at the moment. So all the numbers you have seen before are accessing this system at the moment. Additionally, um, many specific topic organizations have also access to this federation um, and provide services within this structure. And of course, there are a lot of internal applications developed um, using this common AAA standards and using this portal as well. Um, additionally to this government-to-government -government services, of course, we are facing customer-to-government services and business-to-government services that can also be embedded into this Portalverbund, into this Austrian Trust Federation. But then we have to add something like Stork, something like chip cards, which is done with the social security card, for example, and mobile TAN systems. So also here we are following the standards that are going on on the European level, and we have seen um, the initiatives just before. Already in 2010, there were more than 130,000 registered government-to-government -government users and more than 600,000 non-government-to-government -government users. And at the moment, we have about, for just for the Ministry of Interior, 2 million transactions per day. What is the near future? Um, starting with 2012, we, are, we were moving this PVP, this Austrian Trust Federation, to version 2 um, in terms of changing the standard to SAML 2 um, and the e-government profile of the Cantara initiative is also considered in here. Um, what we have to do is when we go this direction and is finished already so we are using it at the moment is to build up central services that are required for SAML Federation at the moment. So it's a change of the system in the background and of course is, this changes also the clients and we have to enforce this change, this update um, of the system for all the participants. Accounting is not a key focus anymore because authentication and authorization, that's the main concept, does not cover 
um, the specifics of the licensing and the usage models behind, and therefore accounting is not a key focus of this system anymore. You've seen the graphic before. It's nearly the same, except um, there are two organizations that do not run um, a service providing um, or an, an application, but only provides an identity, uh, an identity portal. And on the other hand, there's an organization just providing um, a service um, and the service providing uh, provision. So the whole concept behind there is also a service-oriented architecture. So you don't have to run all these components. You can only, only focus maybe on an identity portal. But then, of course, um, pay attention for the contract that has to be established in between the stakeholders. So there are several use cases. And of course, the preconditions. Preconditions mean that this organization A and B are legally independent. Um, so they are not a, a subpart of each other. So they are really independent. And um, organization B, for example, maintains an internal provisioning system containing the identity and attributes of the personnel and their level of security clearance. And in the end, you need this Portalverbund Vereinbarung, the contract signing the trust framework agreement. That's the most important step here. And whenever you uh, have to provide the authentication, you have to make sure that this person that is signing is also using the system. So the use cases is the process of establishing trust. Organization A publishes a set of roles that, of course, may access certain resources, functions, applications, services. Like, for example, the query. Querying a person in the criminal register is one functionality. Organization A assigns a set of roles for these functions, for these services, to Organization B based on the legal considerations. And in the end, Organization B knows which employees are authorized. And these persons, these employees, have to use the roles to access the functionality. What is the process to access a service or a functionality? A simple user Bob is employed in organization B to get access to the application, to the service of organization A. He authenticates at the internal portal at his organization or the organization that is responsible for the authentication portal. If he has done so, then this portal is also used as a proxy to facilitate the access to the applications. And the application will receive a trusted token, a token that says, everything is okay, you can deliver. Um, and of course, this trusted token is um, sent to the portal of organization A um, and identifying the user and therefore providing the functionalities. What are other use cases? Of course, not only an individual, human being may be able to access um, this system, also access from other systems should be possible. So non-human principles. The logging of dele delegated access um, is allowed or is established in here, so we can do application chaining. There's a transaction accounting for paid transactions, and we do have online audit access to show organization A and who has access in organization B. So in order to do some monitoring, we will need the last use case as well. So what are the experiences that we have at, as federal agency? That's the structure that we use. The red big ton up there, this is the dissemination system of our agency. So all the products that go out go via this um, inspired, I call it inspired database or uh, EGU Data Austria. And within our agency, we run, of course, the service provider, which publishes available services to all the others in this um, <coughs> federation. And then there are two possibilities. You may be a client down there that just runs an application software. And of course, you may be not possible 
for any instances to run a user portal or identity provider. But still you need to access the services, for example the download services. Then we offer a user portal and identity provider. You sign the contract with us and then you have access um, to these download services, for example. Or if the client, for example, is a company that runs their own user portal, their own identity provider, then of course it's possible that their clients sign the contracts with them and access our services via the federation. It's also possible in, in this way. Um, for the whole um, sequence that is used, and this is the sequence of the download services, the token within our system is put to a technical user. And the technical user then um, follows all the steps that are used to get a price, to order the product, and so on. And in the end, we receive um, the product, the imagery, for example, which is base64 coded, so it's sent very easily as zip file, as download file to the user. And just to bring up an application that accesses the federation, and is done by a company, which is a client of us, and they are embedding um, the download service, which is an asynchronous download service, which means that you make your order, and you may have to wait one, two, three minutes, depending on your order, or it's, it's, it's ready within seconds, and then you get the zip file to download. It's just to assure that all your orders are fully um, finished and, and you get what you've paid for. And they've built a system to access the zip files, to unpack it and to make it viewable within their discovery viewer, as they call it. That's well established, it's working very well, and of course there are a lot of other customers using similar systems, applications, accessing the asynchronous download service of Inspire in here. So let me resume. Um, this Austrian Federal Trust um, initiative is very well established at the moment. Um, people like it, it's working, and that's the most important, it's working. Um, so it's the central identity management for geospatial, also for geospatial e-government applications, um, especially for e-governmental um, applications. At the Federal Agency for Metrology and Surveying, um, this Trust Federation is used by all the customers to access the Inspire download services. So if you don't want to access the web shop, but you have a computer to computer interaction, then you can access um, these products that we offer via this federation. The requirements, and these are the most important that I see in, in, in terms of Inspire, are we still have to follow um, the SOA principles, um, which means that, for example, the get capabilities are not hidden beyond the federation, beyond this trust contract. This has to be freely accessible, of course. Otherwise, the system does not work as we assume that Inspire should work. And, of course, we should more follow the standardization and establish the interoperable and harmonized operations, um, which also extends existing technical guidance um, for the Inspire download services in a way of asynchronous services, so a specific implementation um, that allows a full business process to the end. What is the resume for the future? We will try, so the e-government of Austria will try to participate the ISA 118 initi initiative and project um, in call. And of course we are looking at further embedding the stork, the EID um, for um, business to government and customer to government applications. And one thing that we especially try to focus on and to use is or are the vocabulary vocabularies um, for the co-location, public, business, and person um, definitions um, that are also published in the joined up portal of the European Union. So this was just a very short report on the experiences that I, me, or the NMCA of Austria has, and Austria within the federated um, approach has. Um, we are using things like this, you have mentioned, Robin, and thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Marcus. Okay, um, questions, comments about authentication, authorization, and accounting, in fact, if anyone would like to comment. You've got one for Marcus. It's all getting a bit incestuous down the front here. <laughs> It's obvious that we've been working on similar things, but uh, we didn't. We decided early, and it was proposed to us not to look at accounting. Uh, that the focus should be more on the first two A's. Was there a reason for you why accounting is less relevant? Well, the reason was that the use cases and the usage of the system was never establishing in the focus of accounting. So there was never the application, applicability of the system within accounting. So the focus stays on the first two. Because my wonder there is if the counting is closer to the licensing story. So I'm trying to make the, the, the connection, yeah? Yes, in fact, something I was going to ask perhaps Daria and, and you was that obviously these two are both topics which have been identified as, as barriers to data sharing, but how do they, where do they come together? And I think it's probably through um, making licenses more machine readable and machine enforceable for that, and maybe a new paradigm about how we license that will bring these two things together, I would suggest. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> my, my, my quick answer is maybe. maybe. Yeah, and, and because the, the point is if we're going to do something on a pan-European basis, it should be well working together. But what's your view of that, um, yeah, what, what, we, what we all know is that we are dealing with very different licenses and that maybe in certain communities or we can have examples of more harmonized licenses what we have seen today and that this system works. But when we are going from one country to another one and we, we want, for example, if, we, if we, our agency would like, to, would like to ask the countries, the data providers for certain type of data, we might sign up up to 28 different agreements and we will have to study all the different licenses for us to understand if we can have the same conditions how to use this data. And this is actually just not workable anymore. I think that everybody else who has to deal with more than one data provider or maybe with one agreement per year might still uh, um, accept this type of conditions. But from this point of view, to share easily data across the border for, of course, for envir environmental policies, to support environmental policies and other policies with the impact on the environment, we will have to face the conditions of different licenses. And this is especially true from the European, at, at the European level. We have to find other ways. And, uh, and the idea first to have the, uh, the, the overview, uh, if the, the common model or classification system of conditions could help at the European level and to the country level, this would be already a step forward. How to embed this type of classification into a more automatic system for authorization uh, or authentication, then this would be another question. But at least something would be there already to test. And I have another very quick question because I'm conscious of time. That's again to Marcus. Um, what about somebody from another country? What about the cross-border activity? How dependent is it on uh, somebody being authenticated with an or uh, organization within Austria first? Okay, as soon as um, neighboring member states are using the same standards, they can be embedded. And the whole thing is on signing the contract. That's the m most important thing in there. Um, so the system works and we try to, to establish it um, for the Lake Constance region. So there we make our use cases and try it. Yeah. Any other questions, comments on this topic? Yes, one over here. Thank you. I'm uh, Dirk Vrindje from Geospark. Um, one of the remarks about signing a contract is um, um, and about the different, all the type of different contracts is um, that um, there is also a need to harmonize um, the meaning of what you are signing. I explain um, by, uh, in, a, in such a trusted system you are exchanging attribute information and um, the semantics of what these attributes just mean are not always the same for one partner in the federation. So the terms of the contract are not necessarily the same um, because 
if you go to a bigger area, um, the meaning of of words of um, definitions can change and um, isn't this um, something that should be that we should be aware of if we want to exchange um, if we want to build a trusted system and that we define exactly what what are the roles what are the um, what is the meaning of being a member of or a GIS expert of uh, of something or Yes, you're completely right. Um, that's a topic, especially if you look at the licensing models and the accounting part. Then it's getting more complicated. For the first two notions, you're just looking at the ID. So projects like EID and Stork are very important to have these very few attributes standardized and un misunderstandable. But for the licensing, no way. Especially if it goes to geospatial at the moment, I don't see a way for Austria. And for Europe, I, there, there's no light in the tunnel, almost. <laughs> Maybe it's just a bend. At the, the moment. Maybe it's just, just a bend the in the tunnel. We've just got to go around the bend to see the light. Time will solve this. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, any other points and comments? I'm conscious that I've kept you beyond the end of the session, but we were five minutes late starting, so I, that sort of counteracts. OK, well, I think personally it's been an extremely interesting session. I'd like to thank all five speakers, uh, Bastian, Daria, Rene, Robin and Marcus, and I hope you'll join with me in thanking them again.